thanks for joining us. I know you're super busy. Um, and, uh, and I'm glad you were able to join. You know, while we have people uh, logging on, I just wanted to give a little introduction about you, if that's okay, for people who sure. don't know you. Uh, so Dr. Nolan uh, is chair and professor of the Department of Atmospheric Sciences here at the University of Miami. Uh, he's a world-renowned expert when it comes to hurricanes, uh, tropical meteorology, computer modeling of weather phenomena, and tornadoes. Uh, he teaches courses on atmospheric dynamics, general circulation of the atmosphere, and vortex dynamics. Uh, he teaches graduate students uh, as well as postdocs who also work at the National Hurricane Center. Uh, he obtained his undergraduate degree from Harvard as well as graduate degrees. And before coming to the University of Miami, uh, he held research positions uh, at excellent institutions, UC Berkeley, Colorado State, and then Princeton. Uh, the, the vast majority uh, of his research has been on the dynamics of hurricanes with emphasis on formation and intensification. Uh, through, through his collaborations with the Hurricane Center, he's been actually able to fly into three different hurricanes. Uh, he's also investigated the dynamics of convection in the tropics and fluid dynamics of tornadoes. So, uh, you know, really blessed to have him here today to discuss a very important topic that is uh, in the media, going over uh, global warming and climate change. And he's spoken about this before uh, in the media, so looking forward to hearing uh, his perspective. So thanks again, Dr. Nolan, for joining us. You're welcome. I'm going to try to increase the amount of light in here, so just keep talking. Sure, sure, no problem. Okay. Um, so I'm going to start with the basics, uh, just for people who, who may not be that well informed. What exactly does global warming mean, other than the obvious? Is it, is it just the obvious, or is there something more to it? Um, well, there is the obvious, which is that uh, the consequences of global warming is that the average temperature at the surface of the Earth, where we live, uh, is, has been increasing, is going to continue to increase. Um, and the changes in temperature, you know, may not sound very large. I think it's about one degree Celsius so far, uh, you know, about two degrees Fahrenheit, you know, which to a person on a normal day, if you said, oh, today it's going to be 77 instead of 75, you know, they wouldn't really notice. Um, but when you average that over the whole world and make over every, every year, you start to see differences. Um, uh, so that's, that's the first thing. But then there are like these secondary consequences. Um, and people actually tend to focus on those quite a bit. Um, so it basically more extreme events, the hottest days are then going to be hotter. Uh, the heaviest rainstorms are going to be heavier, more rain. Um, and more extreme events like that. And um, since I'm an expert on hurricanes also, it does, we do believe that hurricanes themselves, the strongest hurricanes are going to be stronger uh, a little bit. That's not gonna be a very large signal. Uh, there's also some controversy over whether or not we'll have more hurricanes or less hurricanes in the future. And the, the totality of the evidence right now is that we would actually have about the same number or even less hurricanes and tropical storms. But if the, wor the worst ones do all the worst damage, do all the most damage, excuse me. So if the worst ones are worse, <laughs> then you actually end up with more negative effects, you know, from hurricanes than if they were the same. So going back to global warming, um, global warming is basically a steady increase of the planetary average temperature. And it is indisputably caused by the carbon dioxide and other gases that we humans are putting into the atmosphere and in causing those levels of carbon dioxide to increase. Now, people use the term climate change and global warming separately. Are those essentially the same thing when you say climate change, global right. warming? Yeah, so climate change uh, is an invention of marketing. And um, I could be, this could be an incorrect fact, so I'm warning your audience. I think it might have been invented by Frank Lutz, Lutz or Lutz, who basically is a way to kind of make global warming not sound so bad or to qualify it. Um, and even myself, I actually started using the word climate change for a long time. And uh, just over the last year or so, I had a realization that I was also being fooled. So they are the same thing. Uh, and global warming is what it is. It's global warming. Um, there so has it's been a nicer climate... way of saying yeah. it. So it's, it's, a, it's, it's a way to basically make people think that it's something that's not certain, that is, you know, a little bit more indeterminate. Um, but uh, there, there's all kinds of climate change in the history of the Earth. But what we call global warming right now is the increase in temperature which is caused by increase in carbon dioxide and methane, which is caused by humans. Now, you said that it's increasing about one degree Celsius 
I think so far. Long? Well, that would be since the pre-industrial time, you know, so basically since before about the time of the Civil War to now. Uh, and I want to say, I don't have all the numbers exactly right in my head. I think it's about one Celsius so far. Um, and there's a target. Uh, a lot of people want to try to hold the change to two Celsius because they believe that beyond two degrees Celsius, which another degree Celsius may occur in, say, the next uh, 40 to 80 years. Um, beyond that, then the negative consequences kind of start to multiply. So uh, some people have arbitrarily set this target of two degrees is what we want to try to hold it to. Unfortunately, it's very unlikely that we're not going to hold it to that. So it's very likely we're going to increase another one degree Celsius. Um, maybe not in your my lifetimes, but maybe in the next like 40, 60 years. Um, and, uh, and then after that, it will, it will accelerate. Wow. So talk a little bit about those negative consequences, just because you mentioned it before. And I think people need to understand how drastic those effects are. So we're talking about flooding, extinctions, right. Right. heat waves, droughts. Right. What, what, what are the downstream effects? Well, the, um, uh, the most clear uh, and per well, okay, first of all, the temperature is going to increase. And people feel that as, you know, basically it being hotter. Um, you know, here in Miami, uh, I actually lived in, in Key West when I was younger, and then I lived in the other places and came back. And so, um, you know, I sort of remember the climate before global warming in South Florida. Um, and it was a lot cooler in the winter. <laughs> There's no way around it. Um, so now the winters are not, you know, we just don't have as many of those cold fronts and those nice days in the winter. And in the summer, we're very frequently seeing days, you know, 93, 94, occasionally 95 degrees in Miami, which used to almost never happen. Um, in this particular year, there was an incredible number of days with a high temperature above 90, way more than previous years. So the temperature is going up. But people just, you know, people kind of acclimate with that. So people tend to gravitate towards the extreme events. Um, but the factor which is going to have probably the most negative effect for the most people in the long run is sea level rise. Right. So as a consequence of, of the temperature warming, the first thing that happens is when water gets warmer, it expands a little bit. We all think of water as incompressible, um, but it really actually does change its size a little bit with temperature, a tiny bit. But that, that change is actually what's causing sea level rise right now. And that's why we have these uh, sunny day flooding events a couple times a year in Miami Beach and some other places. Um, uh, eventually, uh, global warming is going to cause enough melting of glaciers and Antarctica to start really causing sea level to accelerate, uh, sea level rise to accelerate. And that's just going to affect more people, maybe not so much in the United States, but in the developing world, you know, there's a lot of people who live in the tropics. Um, all through Southeast Asia and the islands, uh, Africa, and so on. And sea level rise is going to affect all of those people. And it, it's not going to go back. You know, when sea level comes up, it, you know, it's like the tide coming in. It doesn't just slosh right out. So um, that's going to be the most pervasive effect. For most people who live in, you know, in the United States, North America, we're going to see the shifting temperatures. Um, and then there's a shift towards basically the wet periods being wetter and the dry periods being drier. Um, and that's just a shift. Maybe we can account, maybe we can adjust to it, but that is more problematic because we have these flooding events and then these drought events. And it, it seems counterintuitive, like, are we going to have more rain or less rain, but actually going to be more rain and more droughts, uh, which is bad in, in both directions. Wow. And so talking about those, those, those coastal cities, mm -hmm. how rapidly are the sea levels going to rise? How much of a problem is that going to be for a place like Miami? Let's just right. say, are we talking about over 10 years, 100 years? I mean, is Miami going to be underwater in 200 years? Is this realistic? Uh, well, 200 years is very far out. So let's try it. You know, I mean, uh, if, for example, if global warming went unabated, you know, with no effort by man to to hold back carbon dioxide and methane uh, for the next 200 years. Yeah, Miami probably would be underwater because of the melting of glaciers. But let, let's just try to keep it more in the near term. Um, it, it's, it's something like um, a centimeter every 10 years. And it actually varies from place to place, which is a, a topic of research, why the sea level rise is different at different places. You think it would be exactly the same everywhere, like in your pool. Uh, but the ocean is not like that. Um, so it, it's, it, there's a very clear impact, and yet it is very slow. You know? But just in the time that I've lived here, so I've been back in Miami now for 18 years, um, and I work at the Rosenstiel School, which some people watching, if you don't know, that's actually a campus of the University of Miami on an island in the Bay. 
So we, we actually like have a little beach, you know, and, and we have a pier, boats and a ship. Um, just in the time that I've seen, I've seen the sea level rise there. I've seen the water at high tide, sometimes a year, coming up higher than it's ever been before. Now, high tides are not flooding downtown Miami. Um, they're very occasionally flooding neighborhoods in South Beach and other neighborhoods with a few inches of water at the highest high tide. So that doesn't sound like a lot. But there are these secondary consequences. For example, if the tide is higher than average and it rains, then the water doesn't drain. So in some of the coastal neighborhoods, you, get, you, you don't necessarily get, you know, you're not necessarily negatively impacted by the tide being higher than it was before, but you get water not draining out, right? You, when, if you live a couple miles inland and the water, and it rains, then that water is supposed to go into the drains and go out to the ocean. Um, and uh, if the sea level is higher than it's ever been before, though, like the, you know, the water in your neighborhood and the sea level are about the same height, so the water doesn't drain out. So you get these rainy day flooding events. Um, and even, again, in the time I've been here, I know uh, I used to live in South Beach and uh, the neighborhood I lived in now, if they have a major rain event, sometimes they'll get like a foot of water on the street, you know, which never happened when I lived there just 15 years ago. Um, so those in the coastal cities, it's, it is going to be very slow, but it's irreversible, right? It's not, it's not going back. It's just it, whatever the water comes up to, whatever problems you're having now, they're going to stay the same or they will get worse. Now, what about king tides? But, you know, there's right. been a lot of discussion about king tides right. getting worse over the last couple of years. Is that a direct result of global warming as well? Right. So this is what I was talking about. I was talking about the, so the tides and, and what we call the, the sunny day flooding in Miami Beach. King tides is just, um, uh, it's an old term for basically the highest tides of the year. Um, and it's caused by the alignment of the sun and the moon, but it's also caused by meteorological factors. So in every place... Um, you know, in every coastal city, basically the, the time of the king tides is different. It may be different for each year. So in Miami, because of the average temperature and the wind direction and the sun and the moon, the highest tides are actually in October uh, right now. And I think there was, there might be one going on, uh, this week, maybe this weekend. Um, so king tides are these high tides that have basically, and then if you just take those high tides and you slowly add the sea level rise on top of it then, you know, every year, each successive high, high tide, highest tide is going to be higher. And it may be only, you know, uh, a millimeter or two millimeters each year. Um, but, uh, you know, it just, it just keeps coming. Yeah, it adds up. Now, I think people don't understand that, that, that the Earth's temperature has cycled for millions of years, well before humans were even around. Mm -hmm. right. And there's the question of how much of global warming is mm -hmm. due to the natural temperature cycling and how much is due to human effect what's your opinion on how much are we involved in this versus just normal weather changes due to environmental cycling right well one of the ways in which the science of global warming has improved substantially over the last uh, 10 to 15 years is being able to better incorporate the natural variations into understanding what's happened in the recent past say over the last 100 years and then out into the future um some people listening might have even heard about this uh, global warming hiatus, like allegedly the global warming stopped for a few years. And it did slow down for a few years because underlying the, 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 sort of the, the, the upward trend are these natural variations on time scales of five to ten years. Um, and so when you put those two things together, sometimes it's confusing. Sometimes it looks like it stops and sometimes it jumps forward. But what's happening is, is like you have a slowly average increase and then oscillation on top of that, and you put them together and it looks, looks like noise. Um, so in the big picture, Earth's climate has, you know, has changed drastically over the last you know, hundreds of millions of years. Um, and then it entered a period we call the, uh, the glacial period, where basically there was glacial periods and then warm periods like we're in now. But what the change that's happening now is so fast than what happened before. There were some rapid changes before, but the changes that are happening now are larger and something like 10 times faster than anything that happened before, as best as we can tell. So there is a natural variability on timescales of a few years, five to 10 years, which makes these you know, small one to two degree Fahrenheit changes in planetary temperature. But they're, they're basically on top of this um, relentless now increase over time. Uh, that is going to overwhelm the, is going to overwhelm those changes easily. Interesting. So you're thinking that the human effect on the environment greatly dwarfs the effect of the normal planetary cycling that would go on even if we weren't around. Is that what you're saying? That's true. Well, I would say you know. So what happened was when global warming was began, you know, maybe 40 or 50 years ago, it was a very small signal, 
And so the planet, you know, the natural signal was better. And so now it's gotten to the point where the human impact is catching up to and overwhelming the natural variability. And it's just a trend. You know, it's basically the same way we were talking earlier about, you know, the tides go up and down. And sometimes there's storm tides from storms. But then on top of that, there's a very, very slow increase in sea level rise. And that's the same thing with temperature. The temperature is very, very slow, but it's steady and it's not going to stop unless we drastically change how we produce carbon dioxide. Interesting. And then you talked about the source of the human uh, footprint is basically through right. the burning of fossil fuels. Yes. Uh, can you explain how we affect the greenhouse gases and the ozone layer? Right. Uh, well, those are separate issues, um, but it's informative, actually. So going back to the ozone layer, that was sort of like a first atmospheric crisis, um, and it was solvable. So uh, it turns out that the chemicals that they put in spray cans invented in the 1950s and 60s would basically eventually percolate up into the stratosphere, interact with ozone, eat it up, and then we would have less ozone and less protection from ultraviolet light. They were able to find a solution to that, which is new chemicals, which basically don't make it all the way up to the stratosphere. And so in a way that, that showed that, you know, with cooperation, it was a much smaller problem and it was a much more easily solved problem, but with cooperation, problems like that can be solved. Um, so what's happening now is humans are producing carbon dioxide and the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is slowly increasing. I think when I was in graduate school, it was something like 340 parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, you know, the air that we're breathing right now. Um, and now it's, it's well over 400. Uh, I can't remember exactly the numbers, 450 or something like that. It's, it's steadily increasing. Now, people might ask, can we show, do we know that carbon dioxide is coming from us? There's two ways to show that. First is to make a budget, like how much did the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere change? How much do we think we made? You know, how much gas and oil and all the stuff that we burn every year? And put those together. And that actually didn't work for a while until they figured out some problems with that budget. And now those budgets actually match pretty well. The other thing is, uh, and it's very technical, there's actually an isotopic component, um, signal that the fossil fuel has a very slightly different number of carbon-13 atoms. The fossil fuel that we burn that comes out of the ground is a very slightly different number of carbon-13 atoms than the carbon dioxide in the air. And so we can basically see that change in the air that we're basically getting isotopically different carbon out of the ground and put it in the air. So that's another you know, um, piece of evidence that we're causing the change in carbon dioxide. And it's the same thing for methane. Methane is a naturally occurring gas, but now there's more methane in the atmosphere, and we know that it comes from us. Now, so in terms of making an impact moving forward, we clearly mm -hmm. have to overhaul the way that we have an energy system. What right. exactly does that mean? Are we looking to brand new power sources, solar, wind, nuclear, geothermal? Like what, how do we overhaul our energy utilization? That is a very hard question. Um, Obviously, we can't give up, you know, fossil fuels uh, today or tomorrow or probably even in 20, 30, 40 or 50 years. That's always going to be, you know, for the foreseeable future, you know, I mean, uh, that's an energy source we're going to have to use. But everything we can do to shift away from things that produce carbon, you know, basically gasoline and oil um, uh, is going to eventually make a difference for somebody. Maybe, you know, my grandchildren or our great grandchildren and so on, maybe their lives will be slightly better because of the shifts that we can make now. Um, so anything that doesn't produce um, carbon dioxide is going to be an improvement in terms of global warming. Uh, nuclear power is one option. Nuclear power has other problems um, that uh, I'm not an expert on, but I think a lot of people have heard about. Um, but it, does, it doesn't produce carbon dioxide. So we have to, you know, in my opinion, uh, a lot of other scientists disagree. I think we have to consider nuclear as one of our options, but then we have to just go for everything else, solar, wind energy, um, uh, geothermal, uh, you know, waterfalls, rivers, everything. Basically have to make every effort to try to get energy out of every other way we can just to slowly reduce this march uh, of global warming because it's, it's just going to, you know, if we don't do anything, it will get worse faster. And if we do stuff, it's still going to get worse, but not as fast. And that's better. Yeah. Uh, now, that's on a... On, on, a, on a country level and on a worldwide level. Right. What can we do as individuals on a day-to-day -day basis to do our part to stop global warming? I think that everything you do to every choice that you make to uh, reduce what you call your carbon footprint um, 
uh, you know, makes a small, small difference. So be what kind of car you, you know, what kind of car you have, does it have better mileage? Is it a primarily electric car uh, or a hybrid or something like that? All those little shifts can make a difference. You know, are you gonna, are you gonna print something? Or are you gonna not print it and <laughs> leave it on your computer? I'm kind of guilty about that because I, I hate reading off the computer. I always like to print my stuff, um, but I'm slowly transitioning to, you know, not printing as much. So everything that you can do to reduce your environmental footprint, you know, which is also overlaps with pollution. Uh, you know, most of the, the things we're talking about are basically just pollution also. Um, all those things that you can do um, to, to reduce your energy use and to reduce your, your use of stuff, plastics, paper, all those things, all that requires, uh, you know, energy and ultimately produces carbon dioxide when it's burned or decayed. So um, if we can do everything, little thing we can do makes a difference. Um, and in the long run, we're going to have to make major uh, changes towards use, getting more and more of our electricity from the renewable sources like wind and solar. And so your, your statement that you made just a little while ago, very important. A lot of people say we will never stop global warming because that's the natural trend. But your viewpoint is we can definitely slow it down significantly. Well, let me just correct what you said. So it's not, global warming is not a natural trend. The global warming that's happening right now is not natural. Nothing like it has ever happened before. It's entirely caused by humans. Um, but it will be incredibly difficult to slow it down. Um, and, you know, to some extent we may, you know, if every single person on the earth started doing everything right, right now, we would still have global warming continuing for quite some time. Maybe we would be able to get it to level off in like 60 or a hundred years and conceivably you maybe go back down at, in a, under a longer time period. So, you know, I think, um, you know, since you're in medicine, like you probably understand there's a lot of things that people can do to improve their health that don't have like any benefit you know, right now or the next day or in the week, but over longer periods uh, will basically result in a better outcome when they're age, you know, 60 to 80. Um, and it, it's very similar, you know, it's, 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 a, it's the delayed gratification or even the, the, no, the no gratification. You're understanding that you're doing something that's gonna help your children or your children's children, um, but is, never, is actually never, may never help you and is actually, you may find annoying right now, like having a, a car that's electric instead of gas. Yeah, I mean, so that clearly is the biggest hurdle, right? People tend to be self-centered, tend to be selfish mm -hmm. overall, and mm -hmm. people need to make sacrifices, like you said, that may have no impact on their lives, but right. it's what's good for the, for the planet. And I, I think that's the biggest challenge. Um, can you talk a little bit about the Paris Climate Accord? I don't know if you're, I mean, you obviously know about it and you can talk about it, but what exactly is that accord? How important is that accord? The U.S. was in it, then it was out of it. What's your feeling on the, on the Paris Climate Accord? You know, I have to tell you, Dr. Kumbhakar, I actually know very little about the Paris Climate Accord. Okay. So it's a little, little out of my area. Um, uh, you know, I think agreements like that, you know, most people might look at them and think, wow, that's okay, there's an agreement, but it's not really an agreement because there's no enforcement. You know, but I think it's just about laying a framework for the mindset of, of our country, our people, uh, our government, and all the other governments. Um, and if people, you know, set targets and maybe they won't reach them, but at least if you have a target and you make an effort to reach it, that's better than having no target at all. Um, so in the short term, I think people will look at something like the, climate, the Paris Climate Accord and say, what is that going to accomplish? Um, but eventually, you know, it, it's basically laying a framework and a, a, a history, a pattern that basically, you know, will probably will hopefully lead to more substantive actions in the future. Yeah, I mean, I think the I think the point, just like you said, is that people are going to cooperate, that it's an international group that are all committed towards raising awareness. I think that's another problem is that is that people aren't aware of how significant a problem is. You know, this is they hear about it, but they right. don't realize that this is this is truly species changing. And I, I definitely want to hear your comments on that. I mean, if nothing is done, will this eventually lead to the end of the human race? Is this an extinction type process that goes on over 100 years, 200 years where there's flooding, famine? Right. Yeah, so people use the term existential threat. And I have to tell you, um, I haven't done any research in this area. You know, when you use terms like that, they're, they're kind of like vague and alarmist at the same time. 
So if we, let's just say somehow we never didn't even know why there's global warming. Like, I mean, we understand it's caused by carbon dioxide that we caused. But suppose we hadn't figured that out yet. And we were still, you know, uh, blasting away with all our carbon dioxide and our oil consumption. Um, you know, would the human race be extincted in 200 years? Definitely not. A thousand years, maybe. You know, I mean, the temperature could go up a lot and, there's, and the technology is going to increase too. So we're going to have air conditioners and we're going to have, you know, bubbles that keep the temperature uh, the same over our cities or something like that in, in the future. So um, I, I think it's more about just quality of life, you know, I mean, the, and, and, and opportunity. And because of global warming, quality of life is going to decline. Opportunities for, you know, for people to have better lives are definitely going to decline. Um, now, if you enact very strong restrictions on developing countries, you know, then you might say, well, their, their quality of life would then decline because of that. And that's true. And so there's a balance that you have to strike there. Um, so, you know, again, I think, you know, it's kind of like uh, hurricanes are a good example. People always ask me, because I'm an expert on hurricanes, like, are the hurricanes going to be worse? Are they getting worse because of global warming? You know, people really, and, and you're in the health business, people want to know, is something going to kill them? Right? If I, if I smoke or if I drink or if I, you know, uh, have super uh, high cholesterol, is, is it going to kill me? And, and, and even for those things, the chances are pretty small that you're actually going to experience the direct negative effect. Um, but the quality of life for everyone and everything that you do goes down if you're not healthy. And same thing, if, if we don't control global warming, we don't make an effort, then the quality of life for everybody in the world is going to decline, you know, maybe a few exceptions uh, in places where somehow they get a slight benefit from global warming. But the vast majority of the population will feel negative effects. And then maybe, you know, places that you might want to go, like islands in the Pacific, you know, will not exist you know, in a hundred years, if we don't try to control uh, global warming. Yeah, I mean, it, it's a crazy phenomenon. I think that we're living in an era where everything is me, 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 and now, now, now. And I think that's gonna, just like you said, have tremendous consequences in the future. Um, so we're gonna wrap it up just because it's, you know, now 12.30. Again, thanks for okay. all your time, David. Thanks for all that you do, all your research. And hopefully we've educated some people here. Uh, as long as people, understand what what a significant problem this is and, and and we work together to fix it hopefully we can all come together okay i hope so thank you dr Komatar. all right david take care all right, bye have a great day